something we've been really looking recording in progress there we are got it there we are so welcome to highlight conversations um, we have three members of the team here today myself Maxine Tate for those of you that haven't met me before I'm going to be hosting this and then uh, we have Miss Eliana Rodriguez who uh, is going to be answering some of the questions today and we're super stoked to hear about and then um, our technical wizard who I'm very grateful for and Melissa Nelson who's going to be looking after us from from the zoom perspective um, so welcome this is the first one of a series just to give you an idea of why this exists and where this this brainchild come from came from uh, we spend so much time talking about what we achieve uh, in skydiving in terms of successes and what have you we don't really talk so much about the journey and as I got to know my teammates I, I heard so many relatable experiences that happened with them during uh, during that time when they they started skydiving you know and to me the journey is as valuable if not more so than the end game and uh, we really wanted to have the opportunity to share that and to see if it was relatable to anything and experiences you had and uh, and just to share those experiences with you um and uh we've certainly come across our fair share of obstacles but we stuck with it to get to our end game so we really wanted to sort of highlight those experiences and and uh and hear from you and answer any questions. It's a form of accessible mentorship and, and sharing of relatable experiences. So that's what we're here to do today. And um, like I said, it's being recorded. You've all seen that in case someone's just joined. And the way that we're gonna flow this, it's gonna be a maximum of an hour. So we'll get an hour to, to chat, but we're gonna open it with myself and Eliana just having a conversation, hearing a little bit more about her backstory and how she got into skydiving. And then I'm gonna open it up to you. We want you to be part of the conversation. And uh, I want you to be able to, to ask those questions directly to uh, Eliana and have that two-way conversation. And the way in which you need to do that is gonna, I'm handing over to Melissa for, for that technical aspect. She's gonna take you around the chat room and show you how to do that. So Melissa, why don't you do that for us? Awesome, welcome everyone. Super excited about everything here. I just wanna get everyone familiar so we can navigate this and ask questions and have a seamless meeting. I'm not sure if you're on mobile or on your desktop, but if you scroll down to the bottom, you will see a chat function. I want everyone to open that up and you will see there's a little drop down there and it should say everyone. Would everyone just message where you are calling in from? So I'm in Western Colorado. So I'm gonna type that in there just so we can see where everyone's at and just so everyone has an opportunity to see how the chat function is used. Yeah, awesome. Delan, Charlotte, Texas, California, CSC, Scott of Chicago. Welcome. Also in that chat where it says everyone, there's a drop down. If you click or tap on that, you can scroll down and you can direct message people individually. Maxine will explain this a little bit more when it comes to the Q&A part, but you will direct message her questions. And for the mute, everyone is muted right now. So if you are called on, you will need to unmute yourself. And when you are done, you will unmute. Maxine, take it away. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm so excited. Miss Eliana Rodriguez, everybody. Da, da, da. <laughs> um, goodness, if I, I could spend a whole hour talking about what Eliana's done in the sport, but I'll, I'll keep it short and cheerful here. She is a multiple world champion. I actually knew Eliana's um, name when I got into skydiving 18 years ago, someone who's very synonymous with formation skydiving. She is a multiple world champion. She's a world champion in in FS, both in four-way and eight-way, both in women's and open, and has been very much a pioneer of a strong, extraordinary flyer who's also female in the mixed team. And that just really is very inspiring to me. And not only that, but this year, she is the inductee, one of the inductees for the 2022 year Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. uh, Eliana, fabulous. So listen, here's the thing. When we had the conversation, I knew nothing about your backstory. And I found it like absolutely fascinating to hear how you went after skydiving, how you how you came across skydiving, and then how you chased down how you um, how you chased down learning to skydive, and and with a number of obstacles along the way. And I feel like the first thing we should do is have you tell us about your backstory a little bit, so we can hear that. All right, sure. Thank you, Maxine, for the the introduction, and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it, and I'm super excited to share my story with you guys. Um, so for me, the way I started jumping was uh, my dad, uh, when I was probably about 14 
14 or 15, he uh, saw an ad in the newspaper about jumping nearby and he asked me if I wanted to go jumping with him. And I immediately say, said yes, because I love, I loved at the time roller coaster rides, like amusement park rides, uh, the really high water slides. So um, I wanted to go jump. And uh, we realized quickly that I was too young to jump because I was, like I said, 14 or 15 or so. And I forgot about it for a little bit. So um, a few years later, I decided to join the military. Um, I was 17 and I realized like people jump in the military. So I asked my recruiter, am I gonna get a chance to jump? And he said, yes, just go, when you get in, just request it. And uh, if any, any of you know about the military, like if you don't have it in your contract, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get it. So I went to my first duty station in Fort Hood, Texas and requested it. And they were like, no, um, because they were not an airborne unit. So there was no interest in them, you know, training me to be a jumper. And then I was in Camp Stanley, Korea and requested it. And they said, no, nope. <laughs> uh, but finally I got uh, stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And that is home of the airborne. And I wasn't an airborne unit. <laughs> and, um, and I requested it and they said, yes. And so I was super excited. I was gonna get to jump out of an airplane. Um, and they looked into the school day and they realized that I was getting ready to get out. I, I was gonna have less than a year left when I, got, when I was gonna go through school. So they said, you're gonna have to re-enlist if, if you want to be a jumper. And um, at the time I'd already decided to get out. So some of, my, some of the guys in my unit said, um, there's a drop zone nearby and you can just go rent a parachute and jump. And, and I thought it was gonna be that easy, but, but it wasn't. So I went over there and of course, no, no, um, you're gonna have to do a tandem that, you know, that's what we offer. And I, I went ahead and did my tandem and, um, it was, it was amazing. I, I loved it, but I was only an E4 in the military, which means you don't make a lot of money. <laughs> and so some of the, some of the, the guys that were jumping on the plane with me, one of them was a golden knight. And he was like, Hey, are you going to do the, um, the course? And I, I, they had already told me about the course and it was like a thousand dollars. And I told them I'd love to, but I just didn't have any money and you know, I wasn't going to be able to afford it. And so he's like, well, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're in the military, you actually can go through a club, a, a skydiving club in the military and you can get the jumps discounted. So I, I, uh, I, he introduced me to the right person and I signed up and I started off through a, a static line uh, progression. Um, and so that's kind of how I got my, my start. <laughs> but um, Becky, you want me to continue? Yeah, please do. I mean, uh, let's just talk through to when you ended up using the tunnel as a, like through AFF and then going to work at the tunnel, because that's a pretty unique story, I think. Yeah, so I, I started with the static line uh, progression because it was cheaper. They had the AFF, the, the static line progression was cheaper, and I thought that's what I could afford. So um, you do five hop and pops, and then you do your uh, five, sorry, five static lines, and then you do your hop and pop. So those first few jumps, you're not really getting any free fall. You know, you climb out on the strut on the Cessna, and then you just let go, and you're 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 in free fall, and and the and the the static line pulls the parachute. So I was doing really well at, at that point. I could I could do that, just let go and present to the relative wind. And then we started getting into like the five second delays and the 10 second delays, but it was still very short. Um, so I'm sure me counting was probably like one, two, three, four, five, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so I started doing that, but I realized like I, I was getting ready to get out of the military and I wanted to be off student status before I left because otherwise I was gonna have to go to a, a civilian drop zone or a you know regular you know go through pay regular prices and it was going to be expensive or I, or, it's, or I was going to have to start all over again I didn't know so I wanted to get done I wanted to be off student status so my instructor suggested that I would switch over to AFF but because I had started I was already pulling for myself on those five and ten second delays they started me at level five um, with one instructor and so we went up on that first jump and I had never been in free fall very long, you know, and never experienced free fall except for the tandem. And um, we, I got out on that strut and I was used to getting out on the strut and they would tell me to go and I would take a deep breath and then I would let go. And so my instructor had me give the count, you know, I was gonna go ready, set, go. And, um, and he would go with me and I got on strut 
And I was like, okay, ready, set, go. And then I went to take a deep breath and he like, he went and he like pulled me off and right away the jump started a little bit crazy. But I, you know, again, I had never been in free fall that long, uh, you know, on my own up, in that, that, up until that point. So I was backsliding. It was just like, it was, it felt, it felt overwhelming. Um, somehow I managed to pull for myself at the right time and he, he passed me, but it was, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, so we went, I went on to the sixth level and on that sixth level, I was spinning. I, I got on my back. They had to flip me over. Um, I, uh, one of them, I didn't pull my parachute, <laughs> you know, on time. So they had to pull for me. So I ended up having to repeat some levels and I was getting ready to get out. I was running out of time. So Fortunately, um, I was in like I lived at, at Fort Bragg and I was in the military. So my instructors had connections to the wind tunnel because one of them knew somebody there and um, they got me into the Fort Bragg wind tunnel and I, they to fix my body position so that they can help me, you know, graduate um, before I left. So we, we went in really early one morning. I don't even know how much time we did just because they don't keep track of time because you're not paying for it. And it was probably like 10 or 15 minutes it was I think now um but it fixed me it got me stable and I went back and was able to pass my AFF fortunately but uh, later on I also uh went back just to watch other people fly and I got invited back into the tunnel and I got a chance to fly a lot more so by the time I left I was able to you know stay in the middle of the tunnel because this tunnel didn't have the, the walls like you can fall out of the column so yeah, I can stay that. in the middle I can go up and down I can turn I can side slide I can do vertical so I, I was doing a lot of things and I didn't realize that you know it takes time to learn that in free fall like if you don't have any tunnel like I it didn't it, you know I just didn't know right so when yeah. I left and I went to I find I left the military and I moved back to uh, Florida um, and I was going to go back to, to school. I wanted to get a degree uh, in engineering and I was working, I was waiting tables and then going to school. Um, and then I started going to, to drop zones. I went to DeLand first because I didn't realize people had like a, a home drop zone. So I went to DeLand mm -hmm. first, made a few jumps, and then I went to Titusville and uh, made a couple jumps and a friend of mine did a tandem and was going through AFF. So I, and then the people were super nice. So I ended up staying there for the next like 200 jumps. But when I got there and, and at first I was doing solos and then when I started jumping with other people, people were like, wow, you're doing really good. You know, you only have 20 jumps. And uh, now I look back and I realized like the, you know, the tunnel time had really helped me. And I, and I just, you know, I hadn't put the two and two together, but Fortunately, I had my instructors, you know, that were so supportive and and helped me through that period of time because it was uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to pass without that help. And, it's, and those, I feel like those moments happen with a lot of folks. I certainly struggle with AFF as well. And it takes a lot to be able to be confident that you can learn and to not walk away from the sport. Do you see what I mean? Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There was definitely a a time when I was, when I was like out of control, like I don't, and I started thinking, I don't know if this is for me. I'm like, oh, you know, and fortunately, I mean, I did have success in some of the earlier jumps where they said I did good because I was like presenting to the relative wind and I pulled for myself and, um, and I enjoyed my tandem. So I, I stuck with it and got through that part, but the tunnel definitely helped that, you know, gave me that yeah. confidence. Okay, I, I, I got some control. Mm -hmm. And then soon after that, you applied for the tunnel instructor position at Orlando, right? When you still only had a couple of hundred jumps or something like that, is that correct? Yeah, so I, I moved mm. out to, um, I left the military in 1996 and the wind tunnel in or, uh, Orlando, it was the first one of its kind. Now they call them iFlies, but back then it was Sky Venture. That was the name of the company, Sky Venture Wind Tunnel. And um, they were building one in Orlando and I lived in Kissimmee, which was very close. Um, and when I was working, when I was jumping, I was. I was really busy with going to school and uh, you know working part time, and that. But I would try to get out there as often as I could, as often as I could afford. You know, and at first yeah. it wasn't very much. You know, a couple times, you know, in a month. But I did it, it whatever I could. But um, so over the two years, you know, I got to know everybody there. Um, they got to know me, and the one of the girls knew of a, an instructor that was already had already somebody that had already been hired there was her friend and she said that they were looking for instructors and I had about 200 jumps at the time and so when she mentioned it to me 
And she's like, well, you, you live close by, you should go apply. I, I was like, mm, no, you know, I, I only have 200 jumps, you know, like they're probably looking for somebody with like a thousand jumps and like with AF, you know, an AFF rating. And, you know, I just really didn't think that they would hire me. And so she kind of, I felt like she insisted, like she was like, no, you, you're doing really good you should go and um I was I, you know I, I said yes to her just to be like yeah yeah okay but I you know I, I didn't think I was gonna get the job so I wasn't even gonna apply but but I wanted to go fly eventually there but um we were really um like it's like sometimes things are like meant to be we we had these uh fires on the east coast you know so they took the planes from Titusville and DeLand and they flew them to uh, Zephyr Hills. And when we were there, she was like, hey, there's my friend. He was from DeLand. She's like, here's my friend. Let me introduce you to him because you're going to go apply, right? You know, so she, she introduced me to her friend. And then he's like, oh, you know what? The general manager jumps here. Let me introduce you to him. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, they introduced me. And he said, just come tomorrow and bring your res uh, resume and we'll interview you. And so yeah. I was like, okay, I guess I'm applying. And uh, I, uh, all night I spent like trying to like put together a, a resume. And then I went the next day and um, I got hired. <laughs> I got hired to work at the wind tunnel as a, as a tunnel instructor. That's awesome. It's and it's, it's, I saw literally this morning and I, I saw a, a post Adam Grant, someone who I really respect and that he was talking about imposter syndrome. And one of the things that he said was the highest form of self-confidence is believing in your ability to learn. And I hear these stories from you like that, you know, you didn't, you didn't think you had the right experience, but you still went for it at the tunnel. You know, you didn't necessarily have the best AFF, but you believed in your ability to learn. I just think that's such a, a powerful um, modem to keep in the back of your mind that although you may not be there, you should still go for it because if you have the ability to learn and you believe in your, your that you can do that, then you should always follow up on the opportunities, you know? Yeah, I, I there was a quote that says start before you're ready. And I, I feel like a lot of times you feel like no, no, not yet, not until I'm like ready. And you feel like you have to be like just perfect before yeah. you try something. But yeah, start before you're ready. It's <laughs> go for it. You know, and what happens is you end up learning so much in the process, right? Yeah, I love More it. Than you, you would have ever imagined. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. So that's super. Thank you for that bit of background. We're going to open up now. Um, Gulchin, I see you've got a little bit of a story from Eliana from the wind tunnel and a question for her. Why don't you jump on and ask it? Oh, well, um, I first met Eliana at the tunnel in Orlando. I was a new pilot with American Airlines and uh, just was looking at how do I get into the Florida jumping scene because I'd been West Coast before. Um, and I started jumping at... Um, Oh, uh, Sebastian. And, uh, and then the wind tunnel was really just getting going. And boy, I can sure relate to the learning experience. I went static line the whole way. And, uh, you know, that progression of, you know, clear and pull. And I had to do that at like, I had to do dummy ripcord pulls about five times before they finally said, okay, you know, and then one five second and 20 second and I don't know, 30 second. And then there was that weird transition when you you could solo but you really there was no no relativity um and then you just had some really good people who said well let's go jump together and one of my my first four-way was with um uh donnelly kevin donnelly norman kent tom sanders and me but they, more than that, they were they were people who were willing to take somebody who had zero flying skills, and there was mm -hmm. no real way to get flying skills back then. And all my progression by by the time I got to Florida, I was it was pre world team, and I um, had a bunch of jumps, had done a bunch of twenty ways, and been on a couple sixteen way teams. But the tunnel was still new, and relatively new, and not available everywhere. And I thought, well, this is good. And everybody was talking about the uh, uh, mantis mantis position. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, got to got to figure that out. Now, I thought I was a pretty good skydiver by that point, but oh my god, I mean, what a what a completely transformative experience! And I was so lucky to have you as an instructor. I had you? I had Hagen Das. I had a couple, uh, of, you know real all-time great people uh but I was so impressed with you because you know here you were at, at that point I, 
I, I think you were just starting, or maybe as I came later on, you had started a team called the Tunnel Rats. And Tunnel you, Rage. What was it? <laughs> the Deland Tunnel Rage. Tunnel Rage. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I believe you had come in first on, on a competition and you your team was the lowest, had the lowest number of jumps. Yeah. And I was so also, that's, I that's, mean, but after watching you in the tunnel, I went, of course. And I being a pilot where we use simulators for everything, for all our training, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my God, this is gonna transform the sport. <laughs> yeah, I, and you were right. You were right. It really has transformed beyond anything. And I feel like Eliana was right at the cusp of when that Absolutely. happened. Absolutely, right at the cusp sure. of it. Yeah, do you, Eliana, do you, do you feel do you feel like there's still the tunnel is still such a, a major part of uh, formation skydiving progression these days? Yes, yes. I mean, but that story that Gulson tells about our, our, that team, the Tunnel Rage team, we had people with like Thomas Hughes had 100 jumps, I had like 400 jumps, and one of the other guys had 600 jumps, and we won the competition. And I think it was the where people saw that, oh my God, you can use the tunnel for training in the air. Because I think for a little bit, people were still like, it's not the same. You know, I don't know if it's good for training for competitions or world meets. And that was the that was the uh, meet where I think people, it, it helped people believe like, oh yeah, this is, you know, this is really helping people progress much faster. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's still to this day. I mean, I when I worked at the tunnel, um, we were just trying to, Fly, uh, fly on our backs a little bit. So I was trying to sit fly a little bit, get on my head. But now like the, what I see the instru some of the instructors do or just the flyers do all the amazing dynamic stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm like so blown away by it. And it just, I feel like it just keeps getting better and better. And so Tunnel Rage was your first team. How did it, how did you get into the air and, and how did you get spotted for the, for the, big, the, the next big four way team that you were on after the Tunnel, tunnel Rage? <laughs> Yeah, so after that team, we uh, we won the intermediate in 2000, and I was I was in the control room in the tunnel, and I get a phone call. They're like, somebody wants to talk to you, and it was Lilac Hayes um, from Zephyr Hills, and she was putting together a women's team um, because there was a, a World Cup happening at Sky of Arizona in the US, and it was gonna be one of the first um, World Cups for women, uh, four-way women. And there was no US team. And so she, you know, she talked to USPA and got permission to put together a team to be able to represent the US. And uh, so she called me because there was three looking for one. Um, and uh, I, I remember getting the phone call and I was like, wow, yeah, that sounds great. Like, when is it? And I was thinking like next year. And she's like, it's next month. I'm like, what? Next <laughs> month? Uh, are we going to be ready? Like, we haven't even. I don't even, you know, I didn't even know them. Like we hadn't even trained together. And she's like, well, we'll do a few weekends and then uh, we'll train there. And, you know, it was a new event for everybody else as well. So, um, but she goes, I think we can do well and we can, you know, place. And so we went, you know, we did the training that we, she talked about and we went and we won the World Cup, uh, the first one of four-way women's event. And then from there, they asked us to do, uh, the, if we wanted to do the world meet. And so, we trained really hard for the world meet. It was like six months later, it was like really close to each other. And it was the most I'd ever jumped at the time because before that, the most jumps I'd done, it was a hundred jumps a year. And you know, I had like maybe 500 jumps or something like that, maybe, maybe a little bit more, but, um, and then in that period, we did 300 jumps and we did a lot of tunnel and we got a coach. We had Joey Jones as our coach. And um, so we put a lot of effort into it, a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, some training and um, we went to Spain and uh, it was it was one of my favorite competitions because uh, we went in there thinking we would win because we had won the last one and you know we had done a little mock competition beforehand with the teams that were going you know we all we were all training in the land and uh, and we won that like six round little competition that we had so we kind of went in there kind of confident <laughs> and then uh, started off tied. Then we busted, you know, had some penalties. We were down for a few rounds, like halfway through the meet. We we're still like five points down. Um, and we were like, man, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do this? You know, to pick up five points in the next five rounds. And we decided just to be ourselves, like stay, you know, kind of stay in our lane instead of like, because what happened was when we started making mistakes, we started backing off because now, now we were afraid of making more mistakes. And then we were losing points because we were going too slow. So we just said, let's just be ourselves, you know, and just 
you know, just, yeah, let's just be ourselves. And we started picking up one, you know, a point here, a point there and going into that last round. It's one of my favorite jumps because we had a great jump. Um, I was hopping on the 17th, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and, um, and, and we ended up winning by three. We were down one going into the last round and we ended up winning by three. And so after that competition, I always say that I, it changed my life because before that I was still, you know, I was going to school. I was, you know, I was still kind of like, um, you know, not, not fully committed like that. I'm going to be a professional mm -hmm. skydiver. I hadn't even, hadn't, you know, I was working at the tunnel, but I was going to, I was going to school to be an engineer. And, uh, and at that moment I was like, man, I got to figure out a way to do this. This is what I want to do. And I felt like I made a decision. Like I got to figure this out. This is what I want to do. I want to do more of this. And that's when, I, after that, that's when Airspeed called and asked me to come try out. So I feel like, wow. like when, when I made that decision and then more, you know, like more doors opened up, you know. <laughs> you, you've said to me uh, before, small steps have big consequences. Is that one of those situations there when you're just like with the women and just make the decision and, and you put yourself in the right place at the right time by showing up? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's just like even just doing it. I mean, it's doing a jump can seem big to a lot of people, but you know, like just doing a the tandem, just like following that curiosity. It's mm -hmm. like I, I had been thinking about it. It's been on my mind. You know, it wasn't leaving me. I still you know, it's like thinking about this jump. And fortunately, I followed through because I mean, it completely changed my life. Just going and making that one jump like right away. It started that thread where then somebody asked us, you know, the, the guy asked me if I wanted to do the course. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, if I want to do a team and then it just kept it kept on going and it's still going. Now, now I'm on highlight. <laughs> I feel like the curiosity is the precursor to learning, isn't it? That's the reason why we want to learn is because we're curious curious about something they're very closely related I think you know a lot of times people say follow your passion but at the time I didn't know that was my passion I really followed my curiosity and then that led to to my passion so I would just always say like if you have something that's on your mind that you've been wanting to try like go try it and if you don't like it that's okay you know sometimes that happens yeah. but you never know what it could it could lead to, you know, it could, yeah. it could completely, I mean, it's led to, a, it's like it opened a whole new world, you know, people, um, everything, opportunities. I got to, yeah, I've got to go all over the world and it's just been, it's been really an incredible experience. Okay, super. Um, next question. Uh, remember guys, send them to me directly. If you have them, Miss Melanie Curtis, you have something for your teammate. Oh, awesome. I wasn't sure I was going to get called on. This is very exciting. I'm so thrilled. Uh, yeah, Eliana, obviously I know a lot of your story, but I'm, I'm very curious what you would say are some of your bigger lessons, like your, the biggest lessons that you've learned from your vast experience in skydiving in the sport and like how those lessons maybe influence you today. I'm very curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the first one, it is follow my curiosity, you know, um, follow, like kind of listen to that because I think it, it is trying to lead you to where you're supposed to go. Um, but the other thing that I felt like I learned, especially doing teams is like, be okay with making mistakes. Because I, I remember being, when I was younger, I was just like, I felt like I had to do things perfectly. Like, right, you know, you're always trying to do your best and trying to do it right. And I would get really freaked out. Like if I made a mistake or like, oh my God. Um, and uh, I learned that on airspeed that it's okay to make mistakes and also let other people make mistakes, right? You know, like <laughs> not be so hard on ourselves or, or others. Um, and I think that's really, it will help a lot it's taken a lot of away a lot of that pressure like going into big competitions like that you have to be absolutely perfect you're not going to make a mistake because if you go into that competition with that mindset and when you do make that mistake it's going to really derail you right so um i think be okay with making mistakes also um i feel like like in in in, in competitions um i feel like being present always you know, it's, you know, and I know they talk a lot, a lot about that with mindfulness and stuff, but when I'm more present, I deal with things better, you know, as, as opposed to being in my head, it's easy, it's easy to get, get, you know, start telling, start uh, in, in skydiving, you know, you get distracted because you start debriefing, you start going back and thinking back or, or, you know, in life, you know, you're thinking back or forward, but when you're present, um, it seems like everything goes better. You're like, you use the skills you have to deal with the, the situation um, in the moment. Um, but yeah, I think that that was, and, and for me, um, one of the things from skydiving is just 
yeah, that I took that chance um, and it just opened the, so many opportunities and so, so many doors. And um, yeah, I just can't imagine if I hadn't, you know, like, uh, you know, it, what my life would have been like. So now I'm trying to be more open to that, like just trying to listen a little bit more to what, what, what's calling me to that curiosity. And do you, sorry to follow up Mel, but like the yeah, mind, the mindset that you have when you go into competition, I'm, I'm quite interested about that, like whether that's something that's developed over the years as well, because I feel like being able to perform under pressure, whether it's in skydiving or outside skydiving comes with a certain mindset with that sort of idea of confidence, but also still just being yourself. You talked about being authentic when you're still in, in competition. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with training, you definitely develop, the, you know, more confidence, you know, and, and, you know, you develop your confidence in your training, but you sometimes have to remind yourself of that too, because sometimes there's certain meets or certain jumps that you're like, oh my God, and then, you know, you feel like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to braid lock, but you have to remember just to trust your training and just to be present with your teammates. And then I feel like, I, I also, I feel like you'll, you'll deal with whatever comes your way, you know, um, but I, and I tell myself that in the plane, like, um, you know, you got this. Um, I, I remind myself like, you know, I, you know, once I start going like, what if, what, what if, what if this happens, you know, like, what if I miss this? What if I, you know, what, <laughs> all these little what ifs and, and there could be a million of them that you can drive yourself crazy. And so I definitely sometimes like as the, those conversations start to happen in the plane, I'm like, eh, I shut them down. You know, <laughs> I was like, I don't have time for that. Like, you know, and I shut them down um, because they do like little voice, you know, little things start coming up that, um, you know, something's going to go wrong. And um, so I, I shut it down. And then I um, remind myself that I, I, I could deal with whatever comes, you know, if, as long as I'm present, you know, and I, and I remember to breathe, because that definitely helps. Sometimes when people are in the plane, they get tense, and they forget to breathe. So I remind mm -hmm. myself to breathe. And I feel like that helps me uh, be more present. I can, I, I, I mean, with the amount of jumps you have, and the amount of FS jumps you have, like being able to shut down that inner voice is something I can see you doing. Let me ask you, how have you felt when you've been on some of the demos where you're jumping into stadiums for the first time ever? How, how has that inner voice been working for you? Yeah, so I, I definitely, um, like when we, even when we were training sometimes, like, or, or, or even when I was getting my pro rating, you know, and I had to, you know, you're trying to land, you know, on this in this square 40 by 20 every time and, and if you mess up you're gonna have to start all over sometimes uh, I, I recognize that when I have too much conversation going on uh, too much ch chitter chatter it's not good so again I, I if, if I catch myself you know and, and I'm you know I'm getting better at that um, I, I try to shut it down but sometimes I it's been sometimes good like chatter where it's like oh look at this other person's landed that was good and then you get distracted <laughs> so you have to stay focused you know it's like oh, you can't even think about that you just have to stay stay focused and um yeah focus on yourself and your own thing and it's and you you can't be debriefing as you're as you're doing it or else it can take you away from having your best performance mm -hmm. do you what, what do you feel are some of your current challenges i mean you're such an experienced skydiver what what do you what are you finding are, are your biggest obstacles these days um, for me, I mean, there, you know, there's always something new to learn. I mean, I wish I was a better free flyer. I, I was fortunate to be on the 41 uh, women's head down record, which was awesome. <laughs> Um, it was scary because it was way out of my comfort zone, but right now I don't feel like I have the skills to be on the hundred way record because I haven't kept on um, working them and you have to keep, you know, you have to stay on it. But um, so there's lots of skills that I, I could develop and I would love to develop. Um, and again, it's always, you know, that investment of time and, and, and money and energy, but um, uh, challenges for me sometimes is around uh, like just being a professional athlete, you have like back issues, you know, sometimes uh, health issues. And so I would recommend, yes, you know, <laughs> so I would Everything hurts these days, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. I would recommend mm -hmm. people just, you know, that's one thing you wanna prioritize if you wanna keep jumping for a long time is staying fit and staying strong and, and doing all those little exercises that sometimes are boring <laughs> um, to keep yourself, um, yeah, keep things balanced. You know, for me, I, I spent a lot of time as a blind point and four way. So I was always looking over my left shoulder and sometimes things got a little bit out of balance. So um, yeah, so th th those are sometimes a little bit challenging. Um, you know, you wanna be stronger um, 
to, to, to stay in the sport and enjoy it because sometimes sure. little pains can take the the joy out of it it's I mean as you as as I get older yeah I'm not you, I've got a few years on you but I can I can relate to what you said it does get harder especially functioning at a higher level no doubt um ironically having just mentioned health we did have a, a writing question from Georgie who wanted to know if you had any career other than skydiving what would it be so I've been uh, over the years I've gotten really interested in health uh, because I feel like it's um you know, without health, it's really hard to enjoy everything else, you know, really hard to enjoy uh, your family, uh, your passions, uh, to go do things with your friends. And so um, I, so I've been very interested in it and I've gotten a few health coaching certifications, but I think if I hadn't gone down this path with skydiving, I, I might've been a, a doctor, like a, maybe a, and I like more holistic type medicine. So maybe a naturopath doctor or a functional medicine doctor. <laughs> Goodness. Now wow, that's a lot of training. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's interesting to me, but it's uh, yeah. So I, I did the health coaching side to to check it out a little bit. Um, but yeah, to be a doctor, it would it would it would be a really long road and um, yes. also very expensive <laughs> road. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so we've got quite a lot of FS competitors here in the house. I can see, um, and Melanie had a question about high functioning teams, which I think would be very relevant to a lot of folks here in the in the in the chat. So Mel, I. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity. Honestly, I know I could ask you these questions anytime, but this is, you know, and not a space that we typically cultivate. So I'm, I'm actually really excited because I'm, I'm sitting here as a participant being like, what would I want to tap this brilliant mind for? So I, and the rest of the people in the room, by all means, I don't want to suck up all this space by asking all these questions. But one thing that came to my mind was like, what would you say, are some of the critical components to building highly functioning teams? Because obviously we're on one together but, and, and I'm helping co-lead one. And I'm like, I want to learn from my brilliant teammates and you're one of them. So if you have anything to offer on that, I would gladly hear it. Yeah. So I feel like, I mean, for one, I mean, communication, you know, setting up a good system to communicate with each other. Because I, I feel like just from being on teams and coaching teams often that if you don't focus on that early on it, and it breaks down, it's really hard to get it back. Um, so, you know, communicating. And I was really fortunate to um, it, not 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 my first teams, but um, I get on Arizona Airspeed and I was on there for nine years and they already had a lot of really good systems in place on how to communicate like during debrief. And um, so for debrief, we would have like where we started always with the positives, you know, start with what, what we like, because it's really easy to go down the neg you know, the negative route, like, why did you do this? Or, and then also to like own our own mistakes, you know, first, <laughs> you know, when our, look at ourselves first, so how can we fix ourselves instead of right away looking how other people can do better, or what they should be doing. Um, but um, yeah, communicating, we also uh, on, on the top of communication, we would have a meeting once a a week, like if we were training for five days, it'd be the middle day where we called it pass a rock, where we got to, um, we got to just, it was more, more about listening, because a lot of times when people are communicating, they're trying to formulate like, uh, like their answer instead of really listening to the person. So these meetings were, you know, each person would take a turn talking, and we'd say they'd have the rock, and it could be anything, it could be like a cup or a phone or, you know, whatever. But whoever had that, had that item, they would, be the only one that could talk and everybody had to listen and, and really not just listen to like exactly like listen to their words but also really try to understand what they're trying to say um and then um and so we you know we, you know and you know we start with the positives first too like saying you know you know what you like about you know the, the experience or the team or somebody else it could be anything it doesn't have to be about just yourself um and then we would discuss anything that we thought maybe we wanted to share because it was a space that um that if we had any issues um around um like if, let's say on monday we had like a little bit of a miscommunication with somebody we were a little bit angry we knew we could wait till wednesday you, you know we didn't have to like deal with it at, at the mock-up or on the creepers we knew we knew we could wait and then uh we would have that discussion then but a lot of times by the time we got to what you know wednesday like we'd forget about it because it wasn't that big of a deal no but if it was that would be a good place to bring it up 
You know what? Give me one moment. I just realized my battery is getting low. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's all right. Yes. Um, well, whilst you're doing that, um, I, I love the idea of, of leaving it and then forgetting about it. <laughs> I'm personally, that, that, that really resonates with me a lot because I forget about everything you say. <laughs> well, it but, is. It's really useful to, to be reminded of even simple structures like that. You know what I mean? And also the notion of if we are upset, a little bit of time can do so much good to, yeah. to those things. And, it, and also knowing and trusting that you have that space is really powerful. Yeah, for sure. It's a it's amazing how a little bit of time brings perspective to a situation uh, beyond measure, for sure. Yeah. Um, OK, so, Eliana, one of the things that you had said to me when we, we did all our, our chats before this that really struck me was I wrote you surrounded yourself with people that you wanted to be like in throughout your career. And um, Holly had a very relevant question to, to that point. So, Holly, why don't you hop on? Okay. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I actually worried that it could be a, a question that would put you on the spot. So I'm glad that you said that, Maxine. Um, because my, my question was, uh, who do you look up to in the sport? Because obviously it's really uh, important to uh, surround ourselves with people that inspire us. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Holly. <laughs> um, yeah, it, well, I, I was really fortunate early on that I... Um, so I, when I moved to Florida and started working at the wind tunnel, it was like the only wind tunnel, really. I mean, I, there was the one at Fort Bragg, but people couldn't get into that unless they were in the military. Um, but I, it was really the only wind tunnel around and everybody was coming to me. So I got to see all the top coaches training their top teams you know, from all different places in the world. But when I first started, there was two women on top teams. It was Lisan and the Norwegian team. And she was based out of, you know, they would train at Scott of the Land. So I got to see her often. And then there was Dawn English on a team FX with like Joey Jones. And so I remember that was like seeing them on that top team, you know, definitely gave me the sense that like, oh, like a woman's doing it. Like if they can do it, then oh, maybe one day I can do it. Um, so they were definitely early on um, mentors. Um, then, you know, the team, you know, before I got on the team, we all knew about Arizona Airspeed. Um, and they were um, not only the top team in the US, but at the time, you know, they were in the world. And um, a lot of when I got on the team, a lot of my teammates on the team, you know, they have a lot of different qualities that I, you know, have been taking a little bit from everybody. And also the, the past team members, like, you know, Dan, Dan BC, Jack Jeffries, you know, uh, Mark was on our team and um, Kirk was already, is on our team, but um, they would, uh, I got to know them better over the years. And, um, and I actually got a to do a team with Dan <laughs> the last couple of years, which was amazing and, and really fun. And we've become great friends. And uh, so definitely admire, admire them and what they did uh, for the team, you know, and what, you know, it was like, I got to benefit from all the work they did for, for the team. Um, I, I, the, my teammates on highlight also, I mean, I got, how can you, it's like, I'm surrounded by amazing women, you know, doing their the best at, you know, what they do in all the different areas. Um, so um, again, I'm, I've been super fortunate, but um, I feel like, like, one of the things with Maxine was saying that if you want to do something like whatever you want to do, like you want to become a pilot, you want just the more you go and be around it, I think the, the, you know you'll you'll start to learn more, you'll start to meet people, opportunities will come up. Um, so like if you want to do anything, you want to get better at anything, just go and be around it. I think there's a lot to be said for I, I like the phrase "don't be a big fish in a little pond." You know the idea that you should always try and surround yourself with people who are better than you are at what you do, because if you surround yourself with the right people, they will raise you up. And I know that I've certainly had that in my career, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it, you know, and here, like when we were uh, training with Airspeed here, we would always have like our, our debrief, it, like when I first got here, it was out in the open. So people could come and listen and, and hear. And if we we're ever like at the mock-up and, you know, we were working on our exit and somebody needed some help, we would be happy to help. So um, yeah, so being around people that are at that level, a lot of times they're, they're happy to share and help. So yeah, so if you, if you yeah, if, you, if you're ever interested in just, you want to go swimming, find, find the good swimmers and go, yeah. go over there and train next to them, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. dancing, uh, anything. <laughs> yeah, I love that. 
It's, um, I mean, obviously you've spent a long time in the sport now and I mean, going hard and what have you. Mel had a question, but I'm going to frame it up in a, in a double whammy here. Like she, she wants to know what you do for fun and I want to know what you do to bring balance to your life. For me, yeah. I, uh, lately I've been <laughs> going, <laughs> I've been going uh, paddle boarding, which has been really fun. Ooh. Yeah, and it's, uh, right now it's super hot here in Arizona. So we go really early in the morning, like, you know, 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And uh, it, we go on the Salt River and it's really beautiful. Um, so it's really nice to, to, to do that. Um, I, you know, I'd like to hike. Um, I like to travel. I like to eat. <laughs> I like to eat different food. <laughs> um, I like to go to the beach. You know, uh, oftentimes when we go to California, we have a work trip there. Uh, I'd like to go a little early and, and get to go to the beach and things like sure. that. Um, mm -hmm. I like to I like to read as well. Um, read stuff about health. <laughs> do you still do you still find yourself doing things that put yourself outside your comfort zone? I mean, obviously, as such an experienced skydiver, I realized that doing something with highlight was was relatively new. But is there anything else in your life that you you feel the I don't want to say necessarily fear, but it could be that it's just very much outside of your wheelhouse that makes you take a step back and, and look at what you're doing. Yeah, um, I, yeah, it would definitely highlight for, was different for me, you know, because we that's not something I, I mean, even though we land our parachutes, it's very different when you're doing a demo. And so that that's been very exciting. And like, it's definitely got me out to the drop zone training more because I want to be better at it and want to do well. But um, like I in the wintertime, sometimes I go a snowboarding, which I'm not good at at all. <laughs> I'm still, you know, trying to figure that out. Um, let me see what else. Um, I want to go. I want to take some dance classes. The the, the challenging thing is I I'm not always here. You know I'm like moving around a lot. But I want to like I would like to take some dance classes. I'd like to go like kind of like what I did with the drop zone that I went to different drop zones and then one I connected with one. I'd almost like to take a couple different styles and then see what I connect with and maybe that'll be the next thing. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is there anything still in skydiving that makes you feel a little nervous or gives you anticipation? Uh, I mean, I, I always, you know, you always want to perform well, whether it's uh, I'm going to, you know, going to the nationals, even if it's a team that you just put together, you're like round one, you're still like nervous and you want to do well. Um, or if you're being a player coach on a team, you want to perform well for your, you know, for the people and for yourself. Um, and also like for me, I, and, and it might seem weird. I'm like, when I first started, especially on airspeed, I when I was younger, it's public speaking has always been a difficult thing oh, for me. <laughs> so right now I'm a little out of my comfort zone. Um, Thank you for I, being off first. And I, I didn't realize I was putting you in a in an area of, of discomfort. You're, you're, well, crush, you're crushing it, by the way. Well, thank you. <laughs> but I, I, I developed it through being on the team and having to like coach and, and uh, you know, give a few seminars. And um, it's one of the things that has helped me grow in that area. And I always want to do better. I never feel like I'm do, it, doing well enough. And so a lot of times when I start off with a big group, I always have a little bit of that anxiety that, you know, just mm. because I don't feel like that's my strongest area you know <laughs> but, and how, how do you address that anxiety like what gets you through that yeah so for me I mean I try to be prepared you know because for, like for one like Craig is very good at doing things on the spot like he's very creative and he's you know and, and I look at him I try to I try to do it like him but it doesn't work for me I have to be more prepared and have have to know like how how things are going so I, I take notes and I try to be prepared a little bit like just being prepared for a jump right mm. um I, you know like yeah you know, practice a little bit. I think about, okay, what are, you know, I have my jumps and I think about what we're going to do and what I'm, you know, what I'm going to say. And obviously over time, you know, there's a lot of repetition, so that helps, but mm -hmm. it's still like, you know, I still have that little feeling of anxiety when I have a new group at first, you know, it's just, you know, the unknown, <laughs> but, um, but it gets better and better the more you do it. And <laughs> it, Funny it, that, it, isn't it? That's exactly yes. like skydiving though, isn't it? The more you, it's like the repetition breeds confidence. Yes. And uh, and that's that's part of the learning process, isn't it? Yes. Um, what was the question when there? What? Oh, my goodness. This is a good one. Melanie, about fulfillment. I'm sorry. I just have taken the opportunity. To that's ask. OK. That's OK. I, 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 uh, I like to ask these questions that can apply to so many other things. You know what I mean? As the the life coach in me, the, the person who really cares about the human experience wants to really 
get those those stories from people that I'm interested to hear them from. So that's why I ask a question like this, not to put you on the spot. And if you don't have anything or, or it's too weird, no worries. <laughs> okay. But I'm curious, like what fulfills you the most in your life? Like that can be a buzzword, this idea of fulfillment. But like, mm-hmm. I think when we really connect to the word, it can have a lot of power. So I'm just curious what fulfills you. Um, I think for me, like, I'm trying to think, you know, back through all my skydiving stuff, but I feel like one thing I learned from that first world championship was that I, you know, I, we won, you know, and it was great, you know, to be a world champion, but, you know, I had won other competitions, like I, we had won the, the intermediate, then we won the world cup. But one of the things that made it so much better was that I, we re- worked really hard that time because we had the time to train, right? We had, we really put a lot of money and time and effort. And then that, you know, made it so much better. And um, there's been times when I've won, and, and we've always put the effort in, uh, you know, that's the thing. That's the other thing that we had in the competition. We had the fight. We had the, comp- we had competition. Like it was, it was not like an easy win. And uh, there's been times when we've won and it's been a little bit like we didn't have as much of a fight and it, it wasn't so, you know, it didn't, you know, it was great that we won, but there's been times where we've come in second and we've had to fight it out. And that was actually more fulfilling than if we had, just, you know, walked away with a gold medal. So I think I just really love the, you know, like that, that fight, I guess I'm not a competitor at heart, you know? Um, and, but I think if, you know, when you put in all the effort, you put in all that work, right? You have to put in that time and that work and that, that energy, yeah, that's, that's more fulfilling, whether you, you got the gold or you got the silver and, but you got to, you got to be in the fight, you know, <laughs> you got to play, you know, you got to play for the gold, even if you don't always get it, but it, and, and it's way more fulfilling than if you, you know, like you didn't do a lot of training and you win, you know, <laughs> that, that's, I feel like um, is fulfilling. So I think it, you know, whatever you like to do, it's like, go, go full, full in, right. When you put all the effort in and, you know, you may or may not win, but I think it'll be more fulfilling than if you just kind of have, have to it. <laughs> do you, do you feel like you still do, do you enjoy the journey as much as the result at the end of it? So for me, and now as after going through everything, I I feel like the journey is is it right? It's just now I'm like enjoy you know, and I try to tell the team that like try to enjoy the journey, try to enjoy your teammates, you know, like because the competition that's going to be one day at the end, you know, at the end of the year, it's like one day, and and if if you base your happiness and fulfillment on just that one day then um yeah it's not it's not um but it's yeah it's that whole year of training together um it's i it's we've had some of the most fun and yeah i have some great memories with my team so um yeah i I definitely enjoy the journey and and when you're picking your teammates um you know just yeah you want to pick people that you're going to want to be around a lot you know (laughs) you know because a lot of times people at the beginning they start off good but you know, and they might pick people that are, um, you know, highly skilled, but then they don't like to be around them, you know, <laughs> and so that makes it yeah. really challenging, right? So yeah. it's like, you have to really look at the whole picture and not just, you know, yeah. there's, you know, so, and that's what's important, you know, for yourself too. You want to try to be a good teammate. You want, want to be a person that people are going to want to be around, right? <laughs> and I mean, it's been, it's been quite a long journey <laughs> with a lot of great results at the end of it. I feel like, if we're just going to wrap it up here a little bit, much along that same theme, uh, I just wanted to say, as you look back from your career, uh, what's the greatest gift, gift that you think skydiving has given you over over the many years that you've been doing it? Yeah, so, man, I feel like I'm so grateful for, you know, skydiving, the sport and this community. And I I feel like the community has probably been the best. I mean, it's given me my husband, you know, Craig Gerard, who I met through skydiving. It's given me some of my best friends. Um, yeah, it's just given me so much. It's like, it's made my love life so much more colorful. Like I've traveled the world. I get, you know, I, I have great friends in different countries. Um, uh, you know, the people that I've been around, my teammates, um, amazing people, or just the people that I coach sometimes. I mean, it's just... Mm-hmm. You get to meet people from all over the world, the different ages, 18 through, you know, 80, um, people that inspire you. Like there's one lady here that skydives, her name is Alice Hicks, and she's 70s, she's in her 70s, and she's amazing. She's, 
yeah, she, she inspires me, right? Like getting to meet her and seeing her skydiving in her 70s, packing for herself and um, teaching dance classes at the drop zone. I'm like, wow, okay. You know, she's changing the way I think about what it's like to be in your 70s. And so you meet a lot of people along the way that have shifted my beliefs and my perceptions, you know, and, and it's so awesome that we get to meet so many different people. So I think the community has been, um, has been one of the greatest gifts. But the other thing also that was really uh, an amazing gift was also the belief. For me, I, for me, when I was younger, I thought you needed to get a job to make money, to go, then go do the things you like to do, to go on vacation, then to buy things that you wanted or whatever. And once I started sky uh, working in skydiving, I thought, oh my God, I get to get paid for something I like to do that I love to do. I didn't know that was possible because I think in my, what I saw in my family, everybody was just working to live, you know, like not, you know, they were just working to pay the bills, you know, and then they would go have fun. And so yeah. it made me realize that you can work in what you love. And now it's like, I feel like I can't, I don't want to do any it any other way, right? Like yeah. why, why? <laughs> so yeah, so that those are the two I think big gifts that I've gotten. <laughs> yeah, and it's so wonderful that we're not only is the, the community the gift, but we're inspired by the community back as well. I, I find people with just doing tandems and hearing their story can inspire me immensely too, you know. <laughs> and it's wonderful to have so many of the community here. Um, thank you all so much for, for tuning in. And Eliana, thank you so much for sharing your, your backstory and a little bit more about who you are. Um, I, I love you. <laughs> You're uh, adorable. I'm so glad I'm on a team with you. And, and one of our gifts of being on the team is we get to know each other better. And, uh, and I value that immensely. So thank you for sharing yourself and being a public speaker today. And uh, yeah. everybody, it was a joy having you here. And um, let's continue to have conversations like these because this is awesome. I appreciate you all. And um, we're going to sign off and say hope to see you all out on the field, maybe up in Chicago at Nationals or wherever we see you. Much love. Stay safe. And let's keep chatting and talking. Thank you, everybody. Okay. You guys can unmute. Thank you, Eliana. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>